Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, as we gather to worship, you'll notice it's a little different than it usually is. Because of the snow and the cold this past week, we are doing all of the worship service um, by recording it remotely. I want to thank Jill and Veretta again for the ways that they can pivot and make things work so that we all can have worship and be together in this way, even though we are at home. I've had a few folks say to me recently that they've really learned to like being at home and on the couch and able to um, worship and be together that way. So today is a good morning to cuddle up, sit in front of your fire, get a good hot cup of coffee and join us in worship. We're glad that you're here and we hope that your worship with us today will be meaningful to you. I also want to let you know that today is the first Sunday in Lent on our 40-day journey to Easter. So we welcome you to be with us for this first Sunday of Lent. There are a couple of announcements. On Monday afternoon, evening at 5.30, we'll have our Bible study. Uh, people will gather in the PAC building. You also could join by Zoom. So we hope that if you're interested, you'll join in that um, Bible study. We'll study the lectionary text for the next week so that next Sunday when we come together, we'll have looked at those texts that we will be using in worship. So please join that if you can. On Wednesdays at 630, we have a Vespers worship service that's about 10 minutes, no, about 30 minutes long. And it has um, music and prayer and communion and time just to be quiet and be in the presence of God together. So we hope, too, that you will join at any point in time, Mondays or Wednesdays, any week. Everyone is welcome. I also want to remind you that we have our children providing a children's moment during these remote worship services. That has been the delight for me in so much of what we've been doing with worship. If you have a child or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew or a friend who would like to help do one of our children's times, you can do that with him or her. You can get in touch with Veretta or me and we'll help figure out how to do that. But it really is important for our children to get to lead worship, to be part of worship, to know how important they are to us. And what I know is I tend to learn something best when I hear it from a child. So please let us know if you and your child or grandchild would like to be part of doing a children's message. And now, as we come together in this strange, cold, new way, let us go to God as we call ourselves to worship using the words from our bulletin. We've entered the season of Lent, a time to examine our hearts and our lives and journey with Christ through the suffering of the world. Let us lift up our souls to our merciful God and humble ourselves in God's service. God has marked us as beloved dust and called us together to worship. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, that you have called us this morning to gather together from our own homes. We thank you for the ability to worship together even when we can't all be together because of weather or COVID. God, we thank you that we live in a time where people have used the intelligence and the creativity that you've given them to make it possible to stay connected. So as we enter this Lenten journey, we ask that you beckon us to follow. We ask that you help us listen. We ask that you give us the courage to step out and follow you through this wilderness, all the way to the cross, all the way to Easter. So be with us this day and in the coming week that all that we do might glorify you and that our worship may not end when we leave today, but be part of our every day. Bless us and keep us, O Lord, that all that we do may serve you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join me as we affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed, which is also printed in our bulletins. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, one thing we know as we go through the Lenten season is that we are asked to acknowledge, to look at, to really know our sinfulness and our brokenness, and to present that before our God who loves us and yearns to forgive us. So with a confessing heart and spirit, let us begin our prayer of confession first in silence to pray our individual prayers of confession, and then please join me as we say together our prayer of confession. Let us pray. In the season of Lent, O oh God, we say lofty words about renewing our spiritual disciplines, journeying with you to the cross, or denying ourselves material wants for the good of the soul. Forgive us, O oh God, if our actions are in vain. If we are concerned with the good of the soul rather than the good of your people. If we've twisted this season of penitence into a reason for praise or judgment. If we are so preoccupied with the sin of the world that we cannot recognize and confess the sins of our own lives. Forgive us, O God, and wash us in your mercy. Forgive us, O God, and free us to try again. Amen. Jesus Christ came into the world and lived and died and rose again so that we might have eternal life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are truly forgiven and made new. Thanks be to God. Amen. This morning, as people who are truly forgiven, we are able to receive the peace of Christ that only Christ can give us. And when we receive that peace, we have to go and share it with others in the world, for God's peace is so desperately needed. So let's begin now by sharing the peace of Christ with each other, maybe through a text, maybe a phone call, um, maybe just a short prayer when we send God's peace to others. So may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. This morning, our own Alex Fields will lead our children's time. Welcome, Alex. Hi, my name's Alex Fields, and I made a Lego of the Presbyterian Church, which I go to. And so here is the dome of it, and the columns are right there. And here is the steeple, and like the little, the little people, and the like bushes and bye. Thank you so much, Alex. It's so important to have your leadership in church and we appreciate so much you're doing that. This morning, as we prepare to go to God in prayer, I ask that you take the prayer list that's in the epistle and in the bulletin um, to keep that with you, maybe on your bedside table, maybe on your refrigerator, so that you might pray for our friends and all those listed there, not just today, but in the coming week. As we go to God in prayer, there will be a time for you to offer your silent prayers. So now let us pray. God of the blessed, we praise you for mercy shown and grace given, for living water and spirit's power. We ask you for daily strength, 
for hope for tomorrow, for your word to guide us, and for strong feet to follow you. God of the oppressed, we bring to you the broken ones, forgotten ones, exploited and abused ones. Bring freedom and release, love and compassion to damaged hearts and souls. Hear our silent prayers, O God, for all who are oppressed and marginalized. God of compassion, hear our prayers. God of the distressed, we bring to you the grieving ones, the hurting ones, suffering and wounded ones. Bring wholeness and healing, comfort and relief to broken bodies and minds. Hear our silent prayers for all who are suffering with illness, grief, or hurt. God of compassion, hear our prayers. God of the dispossessed, we bring to you the lonely ones, the homeless ones, thirsty, tired, and penniless ones. Bring hope and sustenance, physical and spiritual food to hungry bodies and souls. Hear our silent prayers, O God, for all those who struggle with poverty and with hunger. God of compassion, hear our prayers. You are good to all and have compassion for all. Make us, O God, people of compassion. We pray all things in the name of the one who came that we might have abundant life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our New Testament reading is from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not a removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our psalm reading this morning comes from the 25th Psalm. As we move into this um, new season, this Lenten season, it's important for us to look together as we walk together um, toward what it means to be people who don't just jump to Easter, people who actually do walk this journey with Christ all the way to the cross. So during this Lenten season, our theme is follow me, for Jesus calls us all to follow him. And each week, the sermons are going to focus on part of the journey to Jerusalem and the ways that we are called to follow. So as we come together during this season, I ask that you each consider what does it mean for you to follow in the footsteps of Christ, to go the hard journey, to take the dark road to take a path that is narrow, to be uncomfortable, to do whatever it takes to follow Christ through this journey to the cross. You know, since the beginning of time, God has called his people to follow him. 
And our Old Testament reading today is a beautiful psalm that prays for God's guidance through challenging times. Psalm 25, which we'll read today, is actually an acrostic poem, which means that every line of the poem begins with the successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And the Hebrew letters of the first, middle, and last lines spell a Hebrew verb, alaf, which means to learn to trust. We read this morning this passage from Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. As God's people here traveling the journey of faith and as ones who've come to learn to trust God's presence with us in every step. So this morning, let us pray this psalm as the prayer it was composed to be. So listen now for the word of our Lord. Let us pray. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. A number of years ago, I worked with a man whose name was William. William was blind and one cold, icy evening, he decided to brave the weather to come to the church to have a hot meal. He lived close by. The apartment wasn't too far away, but the route from his apartment to the church was treacherous. So deftly using his white tip cane, he made it up the icy church driveway and up the slippery steps and into the wet hallway of the church, deftly navigating that journey. But after dinner, a few of us were concerned, and so we decided we'd walk home with William because we didn't want him to slip. On the way, we had a great talk about his blindness, how it came to be and how he managed it in especially bad weather and how he learned to use that white tip cane that he had with him all the time. It turns out that William's mother was diagnosed with cancer when he was 18. Because he was an only child and they were very close, he stayed home and took care of her for the last three years of her life, which were painful and long. But during the final year of her life, William found out that he was losing his sight to diabetic retinopathy. He told us that for about six months after his mother died, he didn't leave his apartment at all. Understandably, his grief was overwhelming. He and his mother had been very close, and after her death, He felt like he didn't have anyone. The trauma of being with her through her dying and of losing his sight left him too devastated to even want to get out of bed. Because of his blindness, he couldn't work. He couldn't prepare regular meals. He couldn't drive. He couldn't do so many of the things that he had done without thinking about them before he had become blind. William told us that more than anything, he'd been terrified. Not able to see meant that he couldn't tell what he might step on or trip over. He might not be able to tell if somebody were to sneak up on him. And he was really scared that he might step in front of a car or a bus and get hit. He said, it was like someone dropped me in the middle of a dark forest full of high undergrowth and no sunlight. I was cold and scared and afraid to move. And of course, I was depressed. 
Inevitably, as we walked and talked for a while, the question came up, so William, what did you do to get out of the forest? He said, not to do something meant that my life would be restricted to one room and I would have to depend on other people for everything. If I hadn't learned to use a cane, I would constantly be afraid that I might step in the street or fall. Not to be with people meant that I would be lonely and I'd certainly stay depressed. And not to make myself and get up and walk through that forest meant that I would never have a full life. He admitted he didn't want to do it. He didn't really have any choice, though. He said, I either had to get up and ask for help and learn to use that cane or give up living altogether. It took over a year, but by the grace of God, I got through that dark forest. Physically, mentally, spiritually, I made it through and came out better than I was before because now I can help other people get through their own trips through dark forests. It was my wilderness experience, he said. That term, my wilderness experience, has stuck with me. If we live long enough, we will all have a wilderness experience or two, and probably most of us already have. There are over 300 wilderness experiences in the Bible, which means that somehow we are supposed to notice them. They're important. And in each wilderness experience, life is raw and uncomfortable and dangerous. It's filled with enemies and temptations and fears. But wildernesses tend to be the places where God's people often experience God's presence. Remember that Moses is tending sheep beyond the the wilderness of Midian and God appears in a burning bush. And Moses at that time is not just tending sheep. The truth is he's on the run, hiding in the wilderness, because you may remember he's wanted for murder in Egypt. And it's in the wilderness and all that complexity, physical, geographical, emotional, and spiritual, that God comes to Moses. He blindsides him. He turns him around and he sends him right back to Egypt to lead his people to freedom. That's the kind of thing that happens in the wilderness. And then remember when Moses succeeds in this unlikely venture of liberating the Israelites from slavery and leading them out of Egypt, it's back to the wilderness. And as those 12 tribes wander in the wilderness uh, of Sinai for 40 years, Israel is born. Those tribes become one people. A law is given. A covenant is made. That's the kind of thing that happens in the wilderness. When Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness, he's tempted to disobey God and grab worldly power. Truly tempted, yet truly faithful, Jesus came from his wilderness experience ready to do whatever it takes to save us from sin. That's the kind of thing that comes out of a wilderness experience. We may not volunteer to go there. We may not like it there at all. But the truth is, we all have or will have wilderness experiences. And here we are in February 2021. The entire world has found itself in in a wilderness disease that's infected 110 million people and killed nearly 11 million. Staying at home is wearing us down and depression is so real. Families are grieving. Politicians are disagreeing. Children are struggling. Education and healthcare systems are both facing mountains almost too high to climb. And small businesses are just doing the best they can to make it. People have lost their jobs and they've lost their homes. Millions of people have lost ones they love so deeply, mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and spouses and children and friends. If there were ever any communal wilderness in my lifetime, this is it. Most people are sick of this wilderness and its loneliness, the long months of it and the mixed messages all around it. 
So why in the world would any one of us choose to walk this Lenten journey this year? Why would any person intentionally choose the next 40 days to live in the wilderness? But that is what Christ calls us to do during Lent, to follow him into the wilderness, knowing it will be hard, but also trusting that in the wilderness, we are most likely to encounter God, as did Moses and the Israelites, Elijah and Job and Paul and Silas, and as did Jesus. All of those wilderness experiences in the Bible suggest that in the wilderness, it is highly likely that God will come to us and things will change and that we will never be quite the same. So this first Sunday of Lent, we began our Lenten journey. If we pay attention and are willing to be uncomfortably self-aware, if we are determined to face our fears in places where our hearts are blind, if we're committed to really walking close behind Jesus as he makes his way to Jerusalem, we will encounter Jesus in the wilderness. I can't predict how, and I don't know when, but I do know that God's word proves that God always meets us in our wildernesses. He is already waiting there for us when we get there. And he is ever ready to walk alongside us as we learn how to use our own white-tipped canes. So on this journey, may God bless us and keep us. Amen. Please join me now as we commission ourselves and as we go forth with our benediction. The time is fulfilled. God's reign is now. Hear and believe the good news Christ offers. We are children of God, beloved and blessed. We are a covenant community with a mission. Be open to all God wants to teach you this week. Seek God's leading every day through Lent. This is a season for renewal and commitment. We will turn to God in prayer every day. God will teach you and lead you in truth. God's mercy and steadfast love will surround you. We will live as people of the promise. We will go out rejoicing in our baptism in Christ. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.